Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. If, uh, if you could turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and then maybe have a finger in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if anyone needs a Bible, maybe raise your hand, and I don't know if somebody can get you one. Let me see if I can get sorted here. See if I'm going to fog up or not. Okay. So, Philippians chapter 3, Hebrews 12. It's good to be here. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is truth. We thank you that it is life and is able to uh, just minister to the very depths of our being. And ask that this morning as we consider your word that you would be able to take it, apply it to our lives right where each person is at this morning. That you would speak. You know uh, where everybody is and how to minister right to them. And so we ask that you would do that, that you would anoint your word by your spirit and give me the words to share. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Christian life is, is often compared to a race in scripture. And, uh, you know, the apostle Paul, he would uh, use that analogy several times. He also uh, told the Corinthians, he said, follow me. Or imitate me as I imitate Christ. And what I want to do this morning is we're going to just look at a little snippet of how Paul sought to run his race and how that applies to our own lives. So here in Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 8 to get some context here. He writes, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the, the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom... I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, there's a lot in there. Just going to get some nuggets out this morning. Paul's writing to the Philippian church from his prison cell in Rome. He is chained 24 hours a day to a Roman uh, guard. He is there for his faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the message of hope and life. And by this point in his ministry, uh, he has been running his own personal race of faith for about 30 years. And during that time, he has experienced many seasons of joy, seeing people turn to Christ, seeing churches planted. He's also experienced many hardships, persecution, perilous journeys, betrayal, seeing people walk away from Christ, close companions. So he's experienced much. His relationship with Jesus, I would describe it as intimate, an intimate relationship with Jesus. His knowledge of God and the truths of the scriptures, of the gospel, are in depth. And we can see that from 
uh, you know, his writings like Romans and been going through Galatians recently and others. And so it would be right to say that Paul was a spiritual giant among men who had been running his race like nobody else, perhaps the greatest missionary that, that ever lived. And he is exhorting us here, or exhorting the Philippians. And he writes of himself in verse 12, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfect, but I press on. Paul wanted his readers to know that although he had gained great spiritual depth, he had run very closely with the Lord, that he hadn't arrived at the finish line yet, that he had not reached some pinnacle of spiritual perfection in his life, where he could now rest until his life was finished. There was much uh, ground in his ministry still to take. Still more length in his race to run. More growth in his own personal character to gain. And depth in his relationship with Jesus. This tells us a lot about Paul, that little statement. That he had a very healthy view of himself. He didn't fall into the trap of looking back and comparing himself with others who maybe weren't running as good as he's been running, and so then he's okay, he's the best. He didn't fall into that trap. Yeah. A trap that you know many fall into thinking that they are so spiritual, that's what uh, Tim is dealing with in Galatians, Yep. so spiritual that you know as they look back, they think that they're, or looking at others, they think that they're better. And it leads to spiritual pride rather than looking forward to the finish line. Imagine a, an Olympic runner, imagine them running, and they're running and they're looking backwards at those behind them, and they're like, oh, they're not running very good. What's gonna happen to that runner? Well, they're probably gonna trip and fall. Yeah, it's not a very smart thing to do. So instead of looking back, or instead of comparing himself to others, Paul compared himself to one, and that one being Jesus, he who him he was pursuing, the one who is and is at the finish line, Jesus, the only perfect one. The writer of Hebrews, that's why I had your finger in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 1, writes, therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is the writer of Hebrews telling us to do? That we would cast off anything that would slow us down. Being honest about who we are in our flesh, and more importantly, who we are in Christ. Not comparing ourselves to others, but looking at Jesus, the perfect one. And comparing ourselves, in a sense, to him. Where are we at? Yeah, where are we at? And what have we gained in him by his grace? The grace of God. You see, when we do that, there's no room for pride. We realize that we're far from perfect. That we have much growing to do. And that anything good that comes out of our lives is by the grace of God. If you are ministered to this morning, it is not Lauren. It is the grace of God, God at work, working through us by his spirit and by his grace. <clears throat> now, back to Paul. Knowing his, his own imperfections, being aware that there was still much more room to grow, 
He writes, I press on. He kept moving forward in his race. You see, there's a danger in the Christian life to reach a point where we get comfortable and we get complacent in our pursuit of Jesus and the things of the Lord. And we can stagnate. We can become cool or even cold in our pursuit of Christ. Yeah. Once again, can you imagine an Olympic runner? They're in a marathon and they're running and there's a little tea stand or coffee stand off the side. And they're running their race and they're like, oh, that looks kind of nice. And they turn off the track to go get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. If you were watching that on the telly, you'd think, okay, that's a little strange. They're not going to win the race. What are they doing? Well, in a sense, we as Christians can do that. I've seen it in my own life, and I've seen it in others. Where we can get cold about our pursuit of the Lord. And such cooling can lead to coldness in our walk with the Lord. And what he does, it can hinder what he wants to do in and through our lives. And many times when our heart cools, this leads to compromise, leads to sin, leads to picking up those weights that the writer of Hebrews is like, no, throw those things aside, throw those things off. Don't let them ensnare you and slow you down. Paul says, I press on. But Paul's in prison, chained to guards 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Where's he going to go? What's he going to do? How's he going to press on? Well, his present circumstances did not stop him from pursuing Jesus. Jesus was very much there with him. And also, too, Paul sought to seize any opportunity that he possibly could, wherever he was, to share the Lord. He would say earlier in this epistle that all of the Roman guards, everyone there knew the reason why he was there. For the gospel's sake. How did they know? Because Paul told them. That's how they knew. And so Paul wasn't going to allow his present circumstances as much as it was up to him to slow him down. He was going <clears> to <throat> keep pressing forward in his relationship with Christ, seizing the opportunities that he could, encouraging other believers, just like writing this letter, encouraging those in Philippi, writing other letters as well at this time. And so although physically chained, Paul did not allow his circumstances to make him a prisoner. He was not a prisoner to his circumstances. And that can be a danger for us. A prisoner to our circumstances. He was always looking for opportunities to pursue Jesus and to proclaim Jesus however he could. To keep pressing forward. To keep running. He's a great example to us in this. And although he had reached a, a spiritual maturity and intimacy with the Lord, undoubtedly, I wouldn't claim that I've reached that. He didn't cool off. He didn't get comfortable. Instead, he writes, I press on. I keep running. Didn't let the circumstances hold him back. That phrase... God bless you. <laughs> that phrase, I press on, in the Greek, it's, it, it's a hunting term. And it, it's the description, they would use this to describe a hunter that was making every possible effort to get his prey, chasing it down, giving it his all. It was also used of runners in a race. Seeking to reach that finish line. You know, when I first was studying this, I thought of that picture that you've often seen, you know, on those nature shows of the gazelle and the cheetah. And you, you really feel bad for the gazelle, don't you? Because you know that you know why they're filming it. It's gonna lose. 
The cheetah's fast, and the cheetah is giving it its all to catch the gazelle, and eventually it does. Sorry. No. When I was young and thin, I used to help uh, undercover security officers arrest shoplifters in California. And I'll never forget, you know, very intent, I'm going to get the bad guy. I'm gonna get the bad guy no matter what. And I happened to be faster than the people that were actually employed to do this job. I was just a stock boy. And chasing people through, you know, have you seen in the movies where you've got two lane traffic going both ways and you have stupid people that run through that chasing each other? Me, yeah? Doing that to get the bad guy. I'm gonna get the bad guy however I can get the bad guy. And that's kind of the intensity of this word. Paul writes, I press on, I press toward the goal. What was he seeking to, to grab a hold of? Verse 12, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. That word laid hold, it means to seize or to snatch by force forcibly grab. That's what I would do when I eventually catch up to a shoplifter. I would grab them with great force, making sure I've got them. They're mine. Yeah. Paul describes his conversion to Christ in very dramatic terms here. It was a dramatic conversion. As though Jesus literally grabbed him on the road to Damascus grabbing him out of his sin, out of his darkness, and grabbing him to himself. Jesus grabbed Paul in order to save him from his sins, to bring him to himself, you know, and that grabbing was forceful. It was with intent and great purpose. And Paul writes that just as the same manner that Jesus grabbed a hold of him and his life, that Paul himself wanted to grab a hold of everything that Jesus had purposed for his life. Paul wanted to grab a hold of everything that Jesus had purposed for his life. He didn't want to miss one thing that God wanted to do in and through his life grabbing a hold with force until he was finally ushered to the finish line. I don't know about you, but I'm going to pause for a second. Water. God's gift. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I want to lay a hold of everything that Jesus has laid a hold of my life for. But my heart can grow cold. I can get comfortable. I can get complacent. I can step aside from the track and get a cup of coffee instead of running my race the way that I should. I can be like a complacent security guard just letting the shoplifter go. I, I can do that. You know, one time when we lived next to a school in Yorkshire, there was children vandalizing the school at night. I could clearly see them from my house. Called the police. I'm on the line with the police. Police are coming, and I can see the teens on the roof there vandalizing. And I'm like, well, if those guys would just run, they could catch them. They didn't even walk faster. And did the kids get away? Yes. Did the police really want to catch them? No. <laughs> Waste of my time and theirs. They weren't really in pursuit. That's not where I want to be. I want to be in a place where I'm pursuing all that Jesus has for my life. I don't want to be in the way. I don't want to be in the way because of my weaknesses, my inhibitions, 
my comfort zone. I don't want to be in the way. I want him to be able to have the freedom to do all that he wants to do in and through. And so that's a question for you this morning. Is do you want to experience all that God has grabbed a hold of your life for? Do you want to experience that? May we all be in that place where we want to experience everything that he has laid a hold of our lives for. Seizing upon all of those things, whatever they are, whatever he has purposed for you and I, that no coldness or slowness or compromise would slow us down. Because each and every one of us, we have been saved with great purpose and intent. Yeah, great purpose, great intent. Paul would write to the Ephesians around the same time. I'm sure you're familiar with this, many of you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have been saved not just to get to heaven. We have been saved to enjoy a living relationship with Christ in the here and now. And he has laid before each one of us good works to glorify him in this life. Doesn't matter who we are, if we're in Christ, he has set things before us to glorify him through. And your, your race, my race, they're different. The works set before you and me, different. But they're all good in him. Now, how did Paul, how did he go about this vigorous pursuit to lay a hold of all of Christ, laid a hold of him for? Verse 13 in Philippians 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Instead of being fooled into the thinking that he had, he had already arrived. Yeah, that there wasn't any more length of track to run. He says, I set my mind to do one thing. One thing. It's one thing that I do. <laughs> I focus on this one thing. Just like when I was chasing those shoplifters. I didn't care about anything else, which was probably not very good. But focused on them. I'm going to get them no matter what. Yeah. Forgetting about what the shoplifters had dropped or thrown aside, whatever it was. Paul says, I forget those things which are behind. It's one thing I do. I forget those things that are behind. Paul chose to leave the past in the past, to forget. Yeah. He couldn't erase his memory, that would be impossible, but he chose to leave the past in the past, not letting the past define the present. To forget, to no longer be influenced by or affected by, to leave it behind. Warren Wiersbe, he wrote this. I'm not going to claim that I did. He wrote, it simply means that we break the power of the past by living for the future. We cannot change the past, but we can change the meaning of the past. There are things in Paul's past that could have been weights to hold him back, but they became inspirations to speed him ahead. The events did not change, but his understanding of them changed. You know, if you picture a runner, a runner in a race that is not going to allow the way that they started the race to determine how they finished the race. Perhaps they slipped in the starting blocks. All the more reason to move forward with great intensity now. 
Maybe they were at the head of the pack at the very beginning. Doesn't matter if they're not at the end. And so trying to maintain that and keep moving forward to be the first at the end, leaving the past in the past. You know, how many people, how many of us, tragically let the past define our present? Whether we're holding on to past defeat or past victory. Regardless, as much as is up to us, we need to leave the past in the past and to keep pressing forward, to keep pursuing Jesus in all that he has laid a hold of us for. Instead of letting the failures or successes of the past define the present or what the future will hold, we need to forget, leave those things in the past, keep pressing forward. Paul continues on. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm reaching forward, and it literally means straining forward. It's a picture of a runner giving everything that they've possibly got, every ounce of strength and energy, Straining every muscle so that they can reach the tape, the end, before anybody else. You know, I remember getting very tired chasing guys. And just thinking, I just got to give it just a little bit more juice. I'm going to get them. Just a little bit more. A little bit more. There's some guys I'm happy I didn't catch because they were really big and that would have hurt. But... That we would move forward with all that we are. All that we are. All that Christ has given us. Moving ever forward in what he has for us now. And what awaits us at the finish line. Moving forward. Let's look at verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Although Paul admits he hadn't arrived, Paul admits that he is a mature runner. He's a mature runner. And there are other mature runners there among the Philippians. And he exhorts them to keep doing as they've been doing. Now, he gives a, a warning in the very next verse about those who dropped out of the race. And that's tragic. And, but unfortunately, we don't have time to look at that this morning. But he's called those. He's called those who are running well to keep running well. And to follow his example. And for us, we, the same applies for us. That we can look at his example, imitating Paul as he was pursuing Christ, to keep pressing forward, leaving the past in the past, continuing to press forward towards the finish line. He calls us to build upon the maturity and endurance that we've already gained in the past and to move forward. And Paul's been using a, a racing analogy, but then he does something maybe strange in verse uh, 17 where he says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have. He uses another analogy, walking. I believe the reason why he does this is he's describing the unity that we should have as believers together. As though we are walking through this life together. It's a reminder that in Christ, we're all in this race of faith together. We're not in the race alone. We're not in the race alone. Unlike a foot race where there are, you know, there's just one winner or a small relay team that wins. In our race of faith, 
There are many winners. We're all winners when we reach the end. And you and I, we're in different stages in our races. Your race, your course looks a little bit different than mine. But we're to seek to move forward pursuing Christ together. We're not called to run alone. We're a team. We're a body in Christ Jesus. We're a body that's knit together in him. And we're called to assist each other along the way. We're a team walking, running together. The mature in the faith helping those who are maybe younger in the faith. The younger helping the mature in return, however that may work out. When I was very young, I was on a cross-country team in America. I was never the best person on the team, ever. I never qualified first, yeah. but I was often in the first of the group that I was expected to be in, which was way back in the back. <laughs> and the track that we ran, the track that we ran, it was a pretty grueling course, down a little valley, up a steep hill, then winding back down through that valley to make the final ascent to the finish line. During one particular race, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I fell on one knee, came down hard. I got up to run. I couldn't run. I was limping badly. Two of my teammates were nearby. Yeah. What did they do? Well, one got on one side, one got on the other side, and they grabbed me and we ran, hobbled, walked across the finish line. Now they could have made much better time if they would have just went and left me behind. But it was more important to them to help their teammate than to get a better time. And so too it is for us in our race of faith. May we run our race well May we also be those who are helping others to run their race well, too. Can you turn with me to Galatians chapter 6? Closing with this, kind of. Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is taken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That word trespass, it literally means to take a false step or to lose your footing. Much like I did when I fell and hurt my knee. We're called to restore. And that means to, to prepare or to set back up. And so for us, let us run our race well looking at the author and finisher of our faith and looking at our brothers and sisters who are running alongside us and if they fall, that we would graciously and lovingly help to set them back up so they can keep running their race with endurance. One last story. I never won a cross-country race, ever. <laughs> but I knew, I knew who would be waiting for me at the finish line. Clapping for me, cheering for me, welcoming me with a big smile, no matter what place I came in, it didn't matter. There was my coach, Coach Roach. That was really his last name. 
I've had several coaches in life. Basketball, baseball, swimming, rock climbing. I don't remember any of their names. None of them. I remember Coach Roach. Ah, yeah, it rhymes. That helps. But also because of who he was and how he sought to encourage us even when we weren't the best. And you know, in our race of faith, there is one who is cheering us on, cheering us on. Yeah. One who's going to welcome us into our heavenly reward with a glowing smile, a loving hug, and words of reward upon his lips. Jesus awaits at the end of the finish line. And so let us leave the past in the past. Let us move forward with him. And you know, perhaps this morning, you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior. Perhaps you don't know him. Well, in, in racing terms, in racing terms, unfortunately, you're disqualified from the race. Now, everyone here at one point in time was disqualified. We were disqualified because of our sin, because of the wrong things that we do, lying, stealing, whatever it is, disqualifying us before God, who is perfect in every way. Our sin, like a barrier between us and knowing God. But God, who is perfect, is also perfectly loving. He knows that sin disqualifies us and creates that barrier between us. And so in his love, in his grace, in his mercy, he provided a solution, a payment for all the wrong that we've done to take away that barrier between us and him. And that payment, of course, came in person of Jesus. God who took upon himself humanity, lived a sinless life, and willingly laid down that life on the cross in death to pay the penalty of our sins. And he proved that he had power over sin, over death, over our spiritual adversary by rising from the dead days later. And Jesus invites everyone. I'm so thankful that he invites everyone. He invites everyone to take what he did on the cross and to be able to apply it on your account. So this morning, if, if you haven't made that transaction, I encourage you. I encourage you as I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to admit that yeah, you, you've sinned, you've done wrong. That you accept his offer of forgiveness and his offer of relationship with him. And if you do that, you will no longer be disqualified. You'll be in the race and headed to heaven. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you once again this morning for your goodness and your grace. Jesus, thank you for coming and giving your life for ours. Spirit, thank you for revealing to us the truth about who we are and who God is. Jesus is. And Lord, we ask that this morning, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would confess unto you in their hearts that they have done wrong, that they have sinned, and that they would invite you to forgive them and to come into their life and to make them new. 
And Lord, for all my brothers and sisters that have already made that transaction and are running their race of faith, Lord, may you continue to encourage them, equip them, help them to run well. If you put your finger on any weights and snares in their lives, help them to cast those aside so they can run with endurance. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. with the grace so don't forget ladies and gentlemen lighthouse beach 4 30 today fellowship food football volleyball and don't forget to see darlene for the sign up sheet for the blankets amen the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore amen amen, amen. thank you have a good fellowship Sandwiches will be at the back, so please remember social distancing, keep your masks on. If you could eat the sandwiches outside, that would be great. Thank you.